Welcome to Tuesdays with Merton. My name is Teresa Sandak. I'm a Servite sister and a member of the Tuesdays with Merton Planning Committee, along with Daniel Horan and Ellen Culp. Dan is a Franciscan friar and director of the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana. Ellen holds the chair in Faith and Life at Baldwin Wallace, Wallace University, where he is a professor of religion, and he is also a member of the board of directors of the International Thomas Merton Society. Tuesdays with Merton is co-sponsored by the International Thomas Merton Society and the Center for Spirituality at St. Mary's College. The webinars are aired on the second Tuesday of each month. Please note that we are recording this webinar. It will be available on YouTube and as a podcast soon after the live event. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Gordon Oyer. Gordon is the author of Signs of Hope, Thomas Merton's Letters on Peace, Race, and Ecology and Pursuing the Spiritual Roots of Protest. For his book, Pursuing the Spiritual Roots of Protest, he received the 2015 International Thomas Merton Society's Thomas Merton Award. The award, also known as the Louis, after Merton's religious name, Father Lewis, recognizes a publication that brings provocative insight and fresh direction to Merton studies. Gordon is retired as an administrator at the University of Illinois, from which he also obtained an MA in history. He now lives in Louisville, Kentucky, and is a member of the Mennonite faith tradition. Here now is Gordon Oyer speaking on Revisioning a Fragmented World, Learnings Through Merton's Letters on Social Change. Thank you, Teresa, for that introduction. And uh, thanks to each of you who have joined as well tonight. Um, I also want to uh, add thanks again to Teresa and to Dan Horan and uh, um, Alan Culp for this uh, opportunity to present uh, uh, on uh, Tuesdays with Merton, as well as a, a quick word of thanks to the Merton Legacy Trust for giving me permission to speak or uh, quote from some of Thomas Merton's unpublished writings tonight. And uh, regarding some of those quotes, I'll just remind everybody that I'm going to be quoting verbatim from some of Merton's writings. And so as he wrote in the 60s, um, it's not going to be gender neutral, and it's not always going to refer to people of color with the terms that we would prefer today. But with that said, let's open with a really brief word of prayer. God, our creator, as we reflect together tonight, we repeat what Thomas Merton asked of you before he addressed the retreat of peacemakers. It's the same request made by Bartimaeus the blind beggar, when Jesus asked what he wanted. So this evening, along with Merton and Bartimaeus, we also ask of you, Lord, that we may see. In your name, amen. So I prepared a PowerPoint presentation to help, help us move through some of the material. And if you'll bear with me as I, as I get that, um, going, there we go. Um, so tonight I'm going to start with a brief overview of the scope and the scale of Merton's approach to his readings. And then I'm going to explore how what he read can sometimes illuminate what he wrote. In this particular case, what he wrote in some letters that, are, that address race and, and ecology, which I studied for the book, Signs of Hope. The title of tonight's session <clears throat> Revisioning a Fragmented World is also the heading for one of the sections in my book. To see more clearly beyond the superficial was important for Merton. His urging to seek our true selves and reject our false selves was largely about seeing through the illusion that our mass culture offers us to construct our identities. Beyond the personal, Merton also there we go. Beyond the personal, Merton also expressed the need to repair social, political, and economic injustices, to pay the debts that they have accumulated, and to question the structures that perpetuate them. But he felt those efforts would be inadequate and most likely fail unless our actions stay rooted in our shared ground of being, as he put it, and we seek healing from a blindness that obscures that connection with other humans 
and with our planet. Uh, Gordon, I think your camera went off. Do you mind just turning that back on for our viewers? Sorry about that. Okay, I'm sorry. How's that? Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I think when I was advancing the slides, I clicked, clicked something wrong. Okay. Um, so in journal entries, Merton voiced his own quest to see more clearly through efforts to unite within himself what were apparent opposites such as the thought of the East and the West, of the Greek and Latin fathers, or the cultures of North and South America, or the superpowers of Russia and the US. He also sought to connect with other ages as well as places, saying that his contemplative life would be senseless otherwise. In this, rather than create something new and non-existent, he sought to recover what already exists but seems to be forgotten in our modern world, as he famously described in Calcutta two months before he died, it's not that we discover a new unity, we discover an older unity. My dear brothers and sisters, we are already one, but we imagine that we are not. What we have to recover is our original unity. What we have to be is what we are. So this title of revisioning a fragmented world alludes to more clearly seeing and recovering that original unity what we already are as human beings, but imagine that we're not. I once heard a speaker comment that Merton's strength was not so much in the originality of his thought, but in his ability to synthesize different ideas into something new, or as the Anglic Anglican leader Rowan Williams once put it, Merton's genius was largely that he was a massively unoriginal man. In that work to synthesize, Merton's reading habits were crucial and he read a variety of material for a variety of reasons. His monastic routines imposed some of those readings, like Lenten readings or material that were required by um, leaders of week-long retreats that the monks held each January, or daily refectory readings that were chosen by the abbot and read aloud as they ate. But he mostly read material of his own choice. For example, his advice to a new novice master shared his own reading priorities for that particular role that he held. He listed out monastic literature, nearly 20 theologians, and then added some background topics of Gandhi, Dorothy Day, liturgical art, psychoanalysis, and, and Eastern Orthodox spirituality. The scope of readings for his own personal study, though, best shows how widely he cast his net for material. Both journal references and the chart of reading uh, notebooks that I'm showing suggest that these readings took off in the late 1950s and then exploded when he entered the Hermitage. Of course, reading was always important to Merton. For example, in a brief 1949 article that was titled Reading as a Path to Contemplation, he asserts how those who really read acquire, quote, a fuller and more perfect existence. In it, he rather dogmatically condemned reading uh, picture magazines and newspapers as, quote, addiction to mental dope, and to most contemporary fiction as a waste of time. But he named as worthwhile some classic novelists, several Catholic authors, and the non-Catholic Soren Kierkegaard, Karl Barth, and Aldous Huxley. Four years later, his book Thoughts in Solitude, which was actually drafted around 1953, states that books can speak to us like God, like good men, or like the noise of the city, depending on their nature. Then later in the 50s, his journal entries begin to reflect more often and more expansively on the act of reading. The 1956 entry distinguishes between spiritual reading, which connects us, quote, not just with words, but with ideas, with reality, with God. Reading which expresses, com, quote, complacent ruminations of orthodox ideas. And he considered Emmanuel Mounier's book on personalism to be spiritual reading. Increasingly, Merton incorporated non-religious material into his reading. In late 1957, responding to the biblical command in 1 John that we economically share with those in need, he aspired to study history and economics to liberate his contemplation 
and become a genuine man of God. In a mid-1966 entry, he shared how solitude was not withdrawal for its own sake, but to seek wisdom and expand his monastic and faith commitments through reading and study to form his conscience and take practical action. Other entries from that same period share similar thoughts. He specifically reflected on the mechanics of his reading habits in a January 1959 entry that I'm, I'm going to read at length. And the list that I'm showing you is what he put in that entry as, as indicating what he was reading at the time that he wrote this. Quoting Merton, some people seem to think that I read an enormous amount, of, but actually I read relatively little. So it is true I get through quite a few books. Most of my reading is done after dinner and walking up and down the road from the woodshed to the mill, and you do not read as much when you are walking. Does it matter how much you read? What matters is the quality and variety of one's reading. Most monks are enclosed within two narrow limits and read too much of the same things, and by losing their perspective, lose their capacity to learn from what they read. I'm perhaps at the other extreme, but I really think that in almost everything I read, I find new food for spiritual life, new thoughts, new discoveries. He obtained his books from a variety of, of places. On most visits to Louisville, he, he stopped at the public library. He also borrowed from academic libraries and from personal friends, including some from overseas. I assume that he got Library of Congress books through interlibrary loan. And his first mention of doing that, which was in January of 1958, shows his emotional investment in them. He wrote this, woke up in the middle of the night with feelings of insecurity, wondering if indeed I really would get the two books I have asked for from the Library of Congress. One was on Ecuador and the other was on Stalin. As you'd expect, Merton developed good rapport with librarians that he encountered. In, mid, uh, in December of 1958, he wrote this, I like the people in the library, smart and friendly and patient with my request gave them a fruitcake, which George, who was his driver, had left over. And then in a November 1961 reflection on the value of his many relationships, he adds this, affection too for the people in the lieu of a library whom I had not seen for a long time. That same journal entry also mentions the value of friendship that he maintained through letters. And I want to demonstrate how some particular readings influence comments that Merton makes in letters. The bulk of my examples are going to pertain to some anthropological readings that Merton began to engage in the summer of 1967, specifically the re readings on the subject of Pacific Island cargo cults. In November of 1967, he tape recorded a set of notes on what uh, on them that were later in, in 1968 transcribed and then edited into a 60-page typed text that he titled Cargo Theology. The term cargo cult refers to a collection of religious-like rituals that groups of Pacific Islanders developed in response to the Western soldiers and missionaries who built outposts among them. The Islanders heard these Westerners mention how the arrival of cargo would solve their problems followed by the miraculous appearance of modern goods and materials, including the alcohol and tobacco that the whites prohibited the Islanders from using. As Merton described it, to the Islanders, cargo came to represent, quoting Merton, the coming of everything good, the coming of, good, of the good time when one will be like the whites and enjoy what the whites enjoy, the coming of the millennium. They tried to figure out how to get their fair share of cargo, and then based on <coughs> observing Western behaviors, developed the magic ritual, magical rituals they hoped would make cargo appear, rituals that the Westerners then began to label as a cargo cult. In February of 1968, Merton mentioned to his agent a proposed book about Indians and cargo to be titled Prophets and Primitives. It would include the essays on Native Americans that he had already written during the past year, plus two more that he planned to write 
before his Asian trip, one to compare the Native American ghost dance with modern cargo-like movements, and the other on cargo cults per se. He never got those two extra essays written before he left, but the Native American essay, essays were posthumously published as the book Issue Means Man in 1976, and a greatly condensed version of his cargo theology notes was published in 1977 as an article in America Magazine. In general, Merton thought that understanding the basic pattern of these native islander cargo responses can help to better understand more complicated modern responses to change. His cargo theology notes are complicated and they ramble and they repeat themselves and they're not all that easy to absorb. But I want to take some time here to highlight four particular aspects of these readings that Merton found most relevant to modern life because they helped to explain comments that he later made in certain letters that again address race and ecological destruction. The first is Merton's appreciation for what the anthropologist Tinnelm Burridge referred to as the mystery. The term alludes to the interplay between the images and the stories that shape a particular group's sense of meaning and the assumptions that it subconsciously holds about the way the world works. This interplay between myth and dream guides how people organize and act out life together. You could think of it as a paradigm or a worldview perhaps, or, a, or just a, a body of shared assumptions. But the key is that it's largely unconscious and it's not explicitly articulated even though it guides what is considered to be appropriate and normal and moral. A second aspect of these readings that interested Merton is how they describe the pattern of human responses to disruption or to abrupt change. These responses don't change the actual underlying myth stream itself, but the ways that people act out the myth stream in their rituals and their behaviors do change. The pattern of adapting involves first recognizing that there's some need for a change and then articulating a path to implement that change. And then finally, the collapse of that path due to either maybe suppression or disillusion failure or a new and, and different challenge that arises. And then the pattern repeats itself. The middle part of this pattern for a path, the, the second part, where a path forward gets expressed especially intrigued Merton. It was typically voiced by a visionary or a shaman or a prophet in traditional cultures or through a new program or a policy or a political body in more modern cultures. Though the, though the modern path can also form around a charismatic personality as well. And I would invite you to think of examples of modern organizing for change around a personality. What's especially distinctive for Merton about this cargo type path forward is how it requires people to both fully reject or repudiate the past, things as they are or as they have been, and also at the same time to fully embrace the better future that's promised and the specific path forward that the shaman or the new program has outlined. A third aspect of this literature that intrigued Merton was how it described the interplay between cargo and Western cultures as a clash of incompatible mysteries that could not comprehend each other. Merton sees the Islander uh, moral, Islanders moral universe being challenged by the arrival of Western cargo, and he portrays its underlying assumptions or the Islander mystery as one of mutual reciprocity. Quoting from Merton's cargo theology notes, this myth is saying that all social and economic life should imply community of interests and real mutual involvement. The white man and the native, accepting one another as persons, as friends, should be mutually involved in one another's destiny. Social life is not just business and dealing, it's true brotherhood, and participation." End quote. That particular view clashed with 
Western underlying assumptions or its myth dream, which was based on a sense of innate, as Merton put it, innate superiority and a right to dominate or to paternalistically impose upon others. The Western myth dream justifies this sense of superiority and rightful dominance on a belief that it relies exclusively on reason, coupled with the greater economic and technological power that that reason produces. Again, quoting from Cargo Theology. We delude ourselves that we have no myth, but that is myth number one for us. Our myth dream assures us that we are totally objective scientific people. We believe that a certain kind of know-how, a certain kind of business acumen, a certain kind of dexterity in appropriating things gives a person the higher right to appropriate to himself what others might be expecting. A clever operator has a right to amass great wealth on the basis of his skill in getting it. And if others don't have the skill in getting it, it's just too bad for them. They're not smart. They don't know how to do business. I have a myth, or we have a myth dream, which demands that other people be kept out of the kind of relationship with us, which would enable them to truly share reciprocally and humanly what we ourselves have, end of quote. Because Merton felt that the Western myth dream not only presumes a moral as well as a pragmatic superiority, and in turn associates that moral superiority with its white skin, we shouldn't be surprised that he considered the Islanders' myth dream of reciprocity to be more compatible with the teachings of Jesus. Again, once, once more, quoting at length from Cargo Theology. He said, theirs is a profoundly impressive statement of a Christian truth, which is built into the natural relationship between human beings. All non-white people, all the underprivileged people of the world seem to feel this enormous yearning for an authentic reciprocity with the white man, which is symbolized by eating together, sitting down at table together, accepting one another as sharers of the same food. This great human gesture has been raised to the highest religious dignity in the Eucharist by Jesus. How often the great sign of brotherhood, the Eucharist, has been robbed of its meaning. How often it has meant anything but what it is supposed to mean, that rich and poor, white man and native, sit down and eat together. There was no moral reciprocity here. On the contrary, now the disturbing truth begins to come clear. Actually, our myth dream demands non-reciprocity with non-white people because our myth dream takes as its axiom our total superiority over everybody else. We have a myth dream which is profoundly unchristian and even profoundly inhuman. Our myth dream takes for granted that non-white people are not to be treated on terms of moral reciprocity. Even when we do manage to treat them as humans, we still treat them as inferior humans. We will not help the non-white to be anything until he can be exactly like us. And we make it impossible for him to be exactly like us. That's the end of the quote. Another important part of this clash for Merton was that Westerners interpret cargo rituals as threats to them rather than as the Islanders attempt to assert their own independent identity as equal humans. And, and the Westerners reacted with backlash then to repress what they perceived to be a, a threat. Finally, the fourth uh, aspect of these notes that I want to emphasize is Merton's belief that the role of myth dreams um, and these patterns of adapting to change are intrinsic to humans in general. Yeah, I missed the slide there, sorry. Um, and because they are normally, they are normal human beings, his point is not to entirely escape them, but to understand them. He saw this as directly relevant to his vocation. Again, quoting Merton. The solitary life is among other things, a life of critical withdrawal from the general myth dream. I am interested in the cargo myth dream because I can see the cargo myth dream too and criticize the American drift myth dream in terms of it. 
This is part of my personal vocation. This is part of my contemplative life. It is important not to escape from all myth dreams into a realm of pure logic, but to be able to move from one myth dream to another, and at the same time to be aware of a transcendent common myth dream, which is basic to the entire human race. Our communication with primitive society demands an ability to communicate also with something deeper within ourselves, something with which we are out of touch. End quote. In applying these theories to events in modern societies, Merton took them beyond what he'd read to something that he'd not seen anybody else do with the material. He recognized these same patterns of adapting and pursuing a new future in modern movements for change, such as Mao's cultural revolution in China, Latin American revolutionary impulses inspired by Che Guevara, even aspects of Catholic renewal movement and flying saucer fascination. Over two decades later, the proceedings of a 1990 anthropological symposium titled Cargo Cult and Millenarian Movements commented that, quoting, it was the monk Thomas Merton who back in the 60s saw something of the underlying unity between aspects of the modern American scene and the cargo cults of Melanesia. And then it, uh, it went on to hope that the symposium could extend his thoughts. Also, in a 2004 Merton Annual article, Ken Elm Burridge himself indicated, quoting Burridge, there is precious little in Merton's car cargo theology notes and that America essay with which I would disagree, end quote. Turning to questions of race in the United States. Merton saw the American Black Freedom Movement as yet another example of a modern movement for change that sought to independently assert a full human identity in the face of white domination. And he identified its shift from nonviolence to black power with those same cargo-like patterns of responding to thwarted change coupled with white incomprehension, fear, and backlash. In making that connection between the two, he describes Pacific Island cargo frustration like this. He said, the Westerners, quoting Merton, the Westerners failure to see the point of the Islanders pursuit of reciprocity is a sign of white arrogance and vanity. And it is also, it is a sign that the white man is out of touch with reality and ultimately headed for disaster. It's something that he should see that he doesn't see and the black man has seen but can't tell him. When spelled out like this, it begins to sound like Jimmy Baldwin. Uh, elsewhere, he says this, as in, as in cargo, the Negro is seeking to establish, first of all, his identity as one capable of getting equality by himself, rather than wait to receive it as a benevolent gift on the white man's terms. It's part of a common drive towards identification realization of one's dignity and assertion of one's rights as a human being. So perhaps in 21st century terms, the, the cargo phenomenon that Merton was studying um, was in part one way to, to, to say Pacific Islander lives matter. Now having laid out these four aspects of Merton's cargo theology notes as background, I'll close with some examples of how these readings relate back to some of his letters, again, on race and ecology. First, in letters to, uh, to Black friends during, during the year 1968, you can see traces of these cargo theology reflections emerging when he encourages them to pursue their own identity independently of what an affluent white society demands of them for full acceptance. In January of 1968, he wrote to historian uh, Vincent Harding, quoting, of course I agree entirely with you about your paper on the uses of the Afro-American Afro -American past. More and more of my work seems to be tending in that same direction. And also, I'm very involved in the cargo cult and their apocalyptic meaning. The idea of a history that is lily white is just monstrous. 
I am with you in wanting to see it all through the eyes of the black and the red. What myths we have to contend with. And then in an April 1968 letter to Father August Thompson, who was a fellow Catholic priest, he wrote, we have to emphasize black and white identity and qualities and rights and see beyond to the inner unity, but that unity is in Christ, not in the affluent society. And then finally, in May of 1968, he wrote to, to classical singer Robert Lawrence Williams in a letter, Few of us realize what effect the brainwashing of the black people by the whites has had in this country. Now at last it is surfacing and the black people are fighting for their identity, first of all. I can only encourage everyone to resist the kind of mental domination exercised subtly by our affluent society. It means freedom for us as well as for you. Few white people know this. Whitey isn't in a position to know how mixed up he is but it is for you to get yourself unmixed up, fighting the white man's values within your soul. I have to fight the same battle in myself because after all, these values are everywhere hailed as truth. You can also see parallels when reading Thomas Merton's Cargo Theology Notes alongside his 1968 essay, From Nonviolence to Black Power. Merton had earlier also encouraged Black Americans to shed white expectations in 1963 essays like Letters to the White Liberal and The Legend of Tucker Caliban, but you don't see the same langu language of cargo theology or of seeking an independent identity, either there or in earlier letters to these same men. So to me, these cargo readings do not necessarily provide him with a new awareness or description of American racism, but I do think that perhaps they offered a different framework and vocabulary to help him to explain and interpret our culture's history of a global destructive relationship with Black, Indigenous, and other peoples of color. These readings also helped him to explain our destructive relationship with the natural world, something that was more important to Merton than I think many, many realize. In December of 1967, when he named his main interest to a forum of humanity scholars, he lists several that you would expect, things like war and peace, significance of the contemplative life, Eastern and Western mysticism. But he also added as a primary concern, quote, questions related to ecology and the disturbance of ecological balance by ill-considered use of technology. Merton's first contribution to that forum was his January 1968 response to a letter that was published there by economist Walter Weiskopf. In that response, he connects these ecological concerns to his cargo readings. Um, quoting, quoting now from um, Merton's response to, to um, Walter Weiskopf. He said, the study of primitive man shows that this sense of fellowship and reciprocity extended to all nature and all other beings. Man was whole insofar as he recognized not only what he was in himself as an individual, but also what he owed others and what he owed the rest of creation. He developed an all embracing wisdom in which everything could be maintained in a vital, basically ecological balance. In our extremely complex and highly organized technological civilization, we have so completely mastered nature that in fact, we no longer live in direct contact with it. An even more explicit, <coughs> excuse me, an even more explicit example of readings influencing his expression of ecological concerns links his cargo theology notes with his um, 19, February 1968 review of Roderick Nash's Wilderness in the American Mind, titled The Wild Places. That review recaps Nash's treatment of American in, environmental pioneers um, like Henry Thoreau, John Muir, and Aldo Leopold. In particular, it cites Albert Schweitzer on the sacredness of all life and although Leopold's principle of an ecological conscience that quote, 
A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Merton replicated both of those quotes verbatim in a letter that he wrote that same February to Barbara Hubbard, who was a futurist dedicated to helping expand human consciousness. She asked for Merton's thoughts on how the emerging space program might benefit, uh, might reflect that human expansion into the universe. And Merton's response reads like a synopsis of his cargo theology notes merged together with a summary of the wild places. He first concedes that although he was mostly ignorant about the space program, he sensed, quote, a sort of cosmic and ritual shamanic dance, end quote, that was in spaceflight, which might intrigue him. And he then launched into a lengthy reflection that I'm again going to quote uh, extensively from. He wrote, I detect two basic kinds of ethical consciousness developing. One, a millennial consciousness, and two, an ecological consci consciousness. The millennial consciousness is like this. All that has happened up to now has been at best provisional and preparatory, at worst a complete mess. The real thing is about to happen. The new creation, the millennium, the coming of the kingdom, the withering away of the state, etc. But if you want to enter the kingdom, it requ requires acts which destroy and repudiate the past and acts which open you up to the future. This consciousness is found in Marxism, in Black Power, in Cargo Cult, in Church Adjournamento, in the Third World Revolutionary Movement, but also Dallas in esoteric movements within the establishment, management, science, etc. Merton then went on to continue. The ecological consciousness says, in preparing this great event, you run the risk of forgetting that we belong to a community of living beings and we owe our fellow members in this community the respect and honor due them. If we are to enter into a new era, well and good, but let's bring the rest of the living world along with us. In other words, we must not try to prepare the millennium by immolating our living earth, by careless and stupid exploitation for short-term commercial, military, or technological ends, which will be paid for by irreparable loss in living species and natural resources. And then at this point inserts those uh, Schweitzer and Leopold quotes that I showed to you a couple slides earlier before continuing to say, my suggestion is this, the space age can be dominated by millennial thinking or by ecological thinking. If the millennial predominates, it may lead to ecological irresponsibility. That can be prevented by a deepening of the ecological sense and by restraint and wisdom in the way we treat the earth and the other members of the ecological community. And then he then concluded by saying, I suggest creating and distributing a new button with the following message, put flower power into space. So in this case, obviously I think, knowing more about Merton's readings of the cargo cult anthropologist and his reading of Roderick Nash helps us to better grasp what we are actually reading in Merton's letters to Barbara Hubbard and to Walter Weiskopf. To conclude, I hope these reflections have accomplished the two main things that I set out to do. One is to offer homage to Merton's expansive reading as integral to his monastic vocation, and also to provide a glimpse of how Merton fed the fruit of that reading and study back into his written communication with others to share it. Assessing Merton's cargo readings for tonight was, I think, maybe something of a gamble. They cover terrain that's unfamiliar to most, and they're complex to unpack, and I have no expertise in it beyond what Merton wrote. But I chose them and Roderick Nash because Merton's reflections about them personally resonated with me on several fronts. For one thing, they anticipate what some 21st century indigenous writers 
such as Robin Wall Kimmerer, are telling us through their traditions that our long-term survival depends on engaging the world and each other with reciprocity. They also anticipate current decolonialist critiques of Western global dominance. And though it wasn't explicitly on uh, Merton's radar in the 1960s, I think that that can also help to lay groundwork for deconstructing the 15th century doctrine of discovery, which was a set of papables that theologically justified the conquest and the enslavement of non-Christians and the taking of their land. They also, I think, underscore a need for white Americans to listen to rather than reactively silence calls from peoples of color to be heard. And for me, something especially significant, I think that his analysis permitted Merton to connect our histories of both racial oppression and ecological destruction back to the same underlying Western assumptions of non-reciprocity and domination. And then in all this, his use of readings illuminate Merton's wish to live in selective continuity with the past rather than to either entirely repudiate it or try to entirely return back to it again. They also demonstrate, I believe, his skill at something that Pope Francis named in his 2015 address to the US Congress, that Merton, quote, quoting Francis, challenged the certitudes of his times and open new horizons for souls. They strengthen Merton's ongoing call to look beneath our unquestioned certitudes and to more clearly see our mutual interdependence within a shared biotic community. They reinforce his urging that we open ourselves to other worldviews and to new horizons of how we relate to other beings. I can understand how reflecting on abstract ideas like underlying unity and relating with reciprocity could seem independent, uh, incidental or maybe trivial when facing some of the alarming events and disclosures that have unfolded so far in 2022. Things like the invasion of Ukraine, expanding revelations about the January 6th insurrection, intensified polarization from a leaked Supreme Court draft ruling. And then in these, unfortunately, how Christianity gets invoked to deepen distrust, oppression, and the fragmentation of our world rather than to heal them. I do believe, however, that it's in times such as these that we most need to keep those ideas within our sight. Merton does not claim that this expanded awareness substitutes for either facing immediate crises or for actively confronting and dismantling structures that embed violence, racism, and economic ecological destruction within them. But I believe that he does at least imply that if we lose sight of this awareness as we respond with urgency or as we challenge those structures, we risk simply furthering a pattern of change that relies on ingrained underlying assumptions of dominating power. Whatever new solutions or structures emerge will then simply offer a different brand of that same oppressive paradigm. And I think that Alexander, or Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow makes a similar point to that. So I will close with one more Merton quote one that expresses hope that humans may still find a way through our challenges. And it again responds to the economist Walter Weiskopf, who had, who had asked Merton about living in complicity with destructive modern structures. Merton said, my eschatology says that underlying all of it in the deepest depths that we cannot possibly see lies an ultimate ground in which all contradictions are united and come out right. The ground of freedom and love, not a mechanism or process. Since we are all potentially, since we are all in potentially conscious contact with this deep ground, we must try to listen 
to what comes out of it and respond to the imperatives of its freedom. In doing so, we may not be able to direct the course of history according to some preconceived plan, but we will be in harmony with the dynamics of life and history, even though we may not fully realize that we are so. The important thing then is to restore this dimension of existence, end quote. May it be so. And thank you once again for, for bearing with me tonight. How did, did somebody exit for me? Yeah, you're also Jordan. What's that? Somebody may have exited, but I entered vo uh, ver verbally, okay. vocally. Wow. Okay. Uh, what a trip you've taken us on, Gordon. Um, I was hoping you'd go all the way to the very end because there's so much to talk about. I barely know where to jump on. I, I wrote a note to myself. I, th I think what you've done is taken me from Eden to the new horizon of an eschatological unity. Um, you began by talking about uh, the original unity, and I stayed with that for a, a bit, trying to imagine what that was and what you wanted. Um, but we've long since, since left that. And then I was intrigued by, you were going to take us, according to your title, into a revisioning of a fragmented world, which makes a lot of sense to me. And then I liked the fact that you, towards the end, finished with uh, the Pope's visit to our country where he talks about the new horizons, opening new horizons out of our certitudes. And so that's why I say, oh, you've given me a new a sense of a new horizon for eschatological unity. Uh, it's not here yet, but it could be because we're in this fragmented world. Um, what I would be intrigued by, I was intrigued by the cargo theology, which I suspect is, is pretty new to, to most of us. And so I appreciated uh, a pretty thorough look at that over a quick period. I was, I was so uh, aware of the first point where you talked about the myth dreams and they're unconscious and unquestioned. And I thought, whoa, boy, there's the problem uh, working on race, working on our echo destructive could you say a bit about how you think Merton helps us become conscious of our myth dreams so that then we can begin to uh, do a better job of changing, a better job of working on unity? So um, how can we move from this unconscious and unquestioned place to an awareness as you use later? Let's start there. Yeah, well, I, I guess the first thing is just to maybe try to get our heads around the fact that that is possible and that exists. The idea that that we um, we may be somewhat, as he said, scientific and logical, but we're more than that, and that there's more going that just to face the, the the at least the possibility that there's a lot more going on in our society and in the decisions that we make personally and collectively um, than what appears on the surface. So that. So, so just conceding that that's possible is probably the first thing. Um, I think another thing that Merton does, um, which is when I was, that, that quote from Pope Francis is one of my favorites, the idea of, of challenging certitudes. And um, I think that Merton throughout his, you know, throughout his writings did, worked hard to do that. He worked, he did work hard. I think that's a great description of Merton. He worked hard to challenge our, you know, our certainties, you know, he he wrote critiques of technology that got put a lot of pushback um, in the 60s and probably still would today. But he was putting things out there that sort of forced people to to rethink what they what they assumed. Um, so um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess that's that's to me that's the starting point is is to uh, you know again acknowledge the possibility of, of those myth dreams cranking away and, tell, and sort of directing what we do, and the possibility that there are alternatives to that myth dream, I think is another part of that. There was a, uh, there was a book that, that came out last year called um, Dawn of, what was it, The Dawn of Everything by two anthropologists, where it did a, a, a massive anthropological survey 
of, lit of anthropological literature. And it sort of came to the conclusion that throughout time, uh, societies have chosen how they wanted to structure their society. And in fact, some, some structures were highly authoritarian, others were more egalitarian, and sometimes they even changed over the course of a season, depending on what that society needs. And it's sort of the idea that a part of being human is the capacity to choose how we relate to each other. We don't, you know, it's not predetermined. It's not a given that the way that we have structured our societies and our economies has to be. Um, so, that, I mean, I think that's one certitude that we need to begin to challenge if we're going to move beyond that. Um, yeah, thank you. There's so much more I'd love to pursue there, but I, I want to switch. I want to try to touch on a couple, three things before we um, sure. reach that hour where we quit. Um, I, was, I was also fascinated by uh, your referencing friends and friendships. I was intrigued by um, you talking about him making friends with the librarians in the various places he went. Uh, for those who didn't see Mary Somerville's note, you should see that. Um, but I was also thinking, well, once he made friends with the librarians, then he had access to all the friends in the library, the books, uh, most of the folks who are, are from centuries past, but current ones. Uh, and we all know how many friends Merton met uh, through letters and so forth. So friendship was a huge thing for him as it is within the Christian tradition. Um, can you imagine perhaps the role of friendship as one aspect of raising our awareness and, and opening us up to uh, the new horizons of our echo destruction and, and perhaps even new ways of living reciprocally together as you put it? I'm interested in the role of friendship as a as a means by doing that well that's appropriate because you're a friend right of course <laughs> <laughs> quicker um uh, no sure I, I think that's absolutely true i mean uh, you know relations relationships are have to be at the core you know of of how we proceed you know in terms of trying to promote um uh change uh promote a more equitable society if we don't you know if if we don't broaden those relationships across our, our normal levels of comfort um, and try to try to develop friendships on a on a personal level, um, we're getting, never going to really make those connections. Um, and so I, I'm not quite sure what to say about that, other than that that I agree with you. And I think Martin worked really hard at that through you know mostly through his letters because he didn't have other opportunities, but. Um, Anyway. Yeah. Great. Another question I, I, I'm always interested in. So you've obviously worked pretty, pretty hard to get this ready for us tonight. It, um, it shows the, the learning that you've done. How has working on tonight's material affected you personally? Um, well, part of the, I mean, a fair amount of this material was I worked on with, you know, for my book. I think working on this particular presentation, I took a, I took a deeper dive, I guess, um, into those cargo theology notes than I originally did. And uh, yeah, you know, if, if I, you know, I, I tried pretty hard, I hope it's, I hope it showed, tried to break it down <laughs> in, into what, what were some of the things that Martin carried forward into those letters and other things that he wrote. Um, and uh, I guess it, it's just, uh, one thing is just an appreciation of, of his, um, ability to recognize um, in things, in readings like that, to, to, to recognize the, the broader, more universal implications of them. I, I guess, you know, part of it would be a broader uh, appreciation of Merton for that. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 at the last minute, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't have, but I stuck in that little extra note on that one slide about Pacific Islanders lives matter. <laughs> and, and I guess the, uh, you know, it's just, you know, when, when you hear Merton, when, when I was reading through this and hearing Merton talk about what those Islanders were trying to accomplish, you know, and, and the idea of, of establishing their own independent identity on their own terms, it's like they were trying to say, hey, we matter. <laughs> and so it just sort of, it's just sort of resonated a connection with what the Black Lives Matter movement is trying to say today. Um, I, I think that that was 
that, that brought it not just to the 60s for me, but that brought it to the 2020, 2020s as well. Yeah, clever. A, a specific question that, that is being asked here. Do you have the source of Merton's article reading as a form of contemplation? <sighs> That's an unpublished article. Um, that was in the archives, one that I got permission to quote from. So, yeah, it was, he, it he wrote it. He wrote it. it it's in the Merton Archives, the Thomas Merton Center. He wrote it uh, supposedly for a Christmas book issue of the Chicago Tribune. And uh, there, but there's no, I didn't go back and look to see if I could find it in the Tribune, but there's no indication in the archives that it was ever published. And I was thinking about that and sort of like, so. If you say that newspapers and magazines are mental dope and you were an editor of a newspaper, would you really want to publish that? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I, I, um, yeah, as far as I know, it wasn't published. And it, it was, you know, it was, it was pure early Merton, pretty dogmatic and pretty, you know, not tolerant of, of, of I, one of the reasons I quoted it was to show how expansive how it, how it, how he expanded his view of reading later in the fifties. But yeah, I, I'm going to make one more comment and throw it back to to Teresa. Your your work about your word about Merton working hard, indeed he did, uh, reminds me uh, talk about three kinds of work: smart work, hard work, and soul work. Uh, there's no doubt that Merton did some smart work which is pretty savvy and at least all the insights that continue coming tumbling through uh, various people here in the in the Merton Society um, no question he worked hard as you have uh, and there's a way in which if it's done right it becomes soul work and Gordon for for me tonight I, I see all three kinds of work you you what you gave to us turns out to be soul work for me in a very interesting and provocative way so I'm grateful to you and Teresa, it's yours. All right, well, thank you so much, Gordon. And uh, also thank you, Ellen, for your interesting conversation. I, I can't help but enter into it just a little bit uh, when it came to the topic of friendship. I remember in Gordon's presentation, one of the things Merton said was that uh, freedom and love are the, um, the key to that deeper sense of unity and reciprocity. So I think that's another way to talk about friendship. Having said that, I want to talk, uh, also thank Father Dan Horan and the Spirituality Center at St. Mary's College for providing the Zoom platform and technical support for Tuesdays with Merton. Um, I've already mentioned Ellen Cope. He, again, so skillfully monitored the, uh, moderated the questions for us this evening. Bob Grip, who posts the webinars on YouTube. Thanks also to Mark Mead, who makes them available as podcasts. And to all of you for joining us today and for continuing to spread the good word about Tuesdays with Merton. You can find links to the recordings of previous webinars at merton.org slash ITMS. There you will also find information about the International Thomas Merton Society. And if you are not already a member, we invite you to consider joining. We welcome donations to support Tuesdays with Merton and you can also make those donations online. Registration is now open for next month's webinar when Professor Malgojata Pox will speak on the geography of Lagrere as Thomas Merton's ultimate autobiography. To register, go to merton.org slash ITMS. And uh, if you don't know her, uh, Malgorzata is uh, an academic from Poland. So for now, goodbye, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you in June. <laughs>